بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين كل عام والجميع بألف خير عيد مبارك على الجميع It's a pleasure having this webinar in in a very I can say a special time where people are attending most of the lectures through online uh, it's the first of its kind of collaboration where the Saudi Heart Association through the pharmacy clinical group were able to collaborate with the Rheumatology Society. Uh, it's a pleasure having them uh, with us uh, hand by hand. Uh, this uh, webinar would be just an introduction for a series uh, of uh, collaboration with rheumatoid uh, people. Um, it's a pleasure having uh, the most important um, topics today. Uh, it's only introduction because we want to see what's the background of both specialty, cardiology and rheumatology, and then we can take it from there. Uh, the Saudi uh, Pharmacy Group, uh, which I'm uh, glad to present them today, is an honor to have Dr. Adania, Dr. Abdelaziz, and Dr. Mohammed uh, as our speakers in this webinar. We want to thank Dr. Hanan, uh, the head of the Rheumatoid Association, uh, who actually was uh, glad and was supporting this kind of collaboration. Thank you, Dr. Hanan, for that. And uh, to start with, I just want you to focus with us. These webinars are done uh, pure scientific, but it has been sponsored by Pfizer. I want to thank Pfizer for sponsoring this, but all data that you will uh, be getting today is a full scientific data with no influence of anybody on the uh, great speakers that will talk today. Uh, it's a pleasure to start with Dr. Abdelaziz Khalaf. Abdelaziz Khalaf, he is uh, a colleague in the University Hospital consultant rheumatology. Uh, he will start about introducing rheumatoid arthritis for all attendees. Uh, Dr. Abdelaziz, uh, it's a pleasure to have you now, so please go ahead and start. Okay, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Kul aam tum bkhair. It's a pleasure to present in the next 20 minutes uh, about uh, uh, rheumatoid arthritis and in form of diagnosis, uh, and then will uh, my uh, uh, special friend Dr. Amir will present for 20 minutes about the management and the guidelines. So, um, the rheumatoid arthritis, as you know, is a chronic inflammatory autoimmune disease. So, it's a chronic means stays forever, doesn't go away, and usually gets progress with time. Uh, may lead to disabling, uh, which may affect the joints, uh, lead to long-term damage of the joints, as well as there is a chance of increased risk of morbidities, comorbidities like diabetes, hypertension, coronary artery disease. Unfortunately, this disease has no cure, but in fact, over the last uh, 20 years, uh, there is an evolution of a new era of management in managing rheumatoid arthritis patients in early phase, where when we can intervene early, where we can change the patho physiology of the disease, maybe, as well as the outcomes that can happen with time with this kind of uh, aggressive disease, if we leave it with no treatment. And uh, the early intervention, uh, the uh, better physical function, which has decreased the uh, uh, comorbidities, as you know, and this is uh, happen especially in our population when they get disabled with the obesity, they get more co comorbidities, uh, which lead to coronary artery disease and other uh, um, uh, bad outcomes or poor outcomes. Rheumatoid arthritis patient usually affects one percent of adult population. Usually, over twenty, uh, there is an over twenty-one millions of people worldwide affected with rheumatoid. More, more than 3 million were affected in uh, Europe, and female to male ratio was 3 to 1. So more female are affected than male in this particular disease, and can occur at any age. However, it's quite common more of above 45. Uh, rheumatoid arthritis has an impact uh, on the economy, and this is a challenge for all of rheumatologists. Uh, we know that uh, uh, this may change with the early intervention in this kind of uh, diseases. And the direct cost was around 14 uh, billion in uh, Europe uh, uh, per year about hospitalization, diagnosis, and treatment. 
in form of cost uh, in uh, economy, as well as indirect cost. Over 17 billions were spent in Europe per year related to productivity loss and disability. So it's very important to know that rheumatoid arthritis can lead patient to be disabled, which can had bad, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> bad impact or uh, not good impact on uh, the economy, especially in healthcare system. Uh, what is impact of rheumatoid arthritis on individual? So a premature mortality can lead to premature mortality, can lead to increased morbidity, as we said. It has an impact on the quality of life in form of pain. Patients with rheumatoid, they live with pain, and sometimes they can have a functional disability if they don't get good treatment. Fatigue is quite common in those particular uh, patients and this specific disease. So up to 70% of those patients, they live with mild fatigue, and up to 40, they live with a severe fatigue. Depression, one of the actually challenge for all rheumatologists uh, to manage uh, such comorbidities can associated with uh, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, which can be up to 40%. Uh, eventually, uh, all of those will lead to loss of productivity and patient get disabled, which has an impact on themselves and their family as well. So what are the risk factors of uh, rheumatoid arthritis? Who are the people who are prone to have more rheumatoid? Maybe genetics has an impact, like a major risk factor on that. And there is over 100 genetic risk factor correlated with uh, rheumatoid arthritis. HLA-DRB1 is the most common one. And we know that smoking also associated with oh, like other autoimmune diseases, but in particular patient who was having ACPA positive, which is just one of the antibodies that uh, we do screen patients with rheumatoid arthritis. They are more to have risk factor to develop rheumatoid in presence of smoking. So environmental uh, risk factors like air pollution, infection, where most of them are inconclusive. However, we believe there is some uh, genetic mutation can happen with this particular uh, incident that happened from environmental uh, point of view. So in pre-RA, as we said, so there is an era where you have genetic risk factor, where you have an environmental risk factor. Over years, you develop symptoms which lead to what's called unclassified arthritis. Then we diagnose patients with rheumatoid at the end. So it's, it's been shown that patients with uh, anti-CCP uh, positive or rheumatoid factor positive with rheumatoid arthritis can have even the symptoms earlier in their uh, life. So um, um, here, here is the challenge here where we really need to uh, focus on those particular patients where we can early intervene on them, which we can lead to change in their disease behavior as well. So there, is, uh, there are a few new terminology in rheumatoid arthritis. We call early RA when we have a diagnosis established three to six months before, uh, three, sorry, three to six months since the symptoms started. And we have what's called established RA and those patients. Uh, the, the difference between them is the time and the, uh, the outcomes measure that you are looking for. So in early rheumatoid arthritis, Dr. Hamid will, uh, Dr. Amir will touch on that. Early rheumatoid arthritis, we target patients in remission. In established RA, we target patients to be at least in low disease activity. A window of, a window of opportunity where we need to recognize the, uh, the disease early in the course, where we can intervene early, prevent some uh, that uh, limitation that can, be, can happen with this, those patients. A treat to target. So those the patient, as we say, this is the outcomes that we are looking for. We need to put the patient on remission for early rheumatoid arthritis patient. As much as we can, we can do that on established RA, but at least we have to put them in low disease activity. So this is the <clears throat> window of opportunity where we need early to recognize the disease, where we can start the patient early therapy. We prevent damage that can happen with time to those patients. So let me pass this one. This is another uh, meta-analysis examining the long-term impact on progression of early intervention within nine months. There is a 33% reduction in the long-term progression rate compared to those treated later. 
So the early you treat, the better outcomes that you, uh, you can uh, also uh, get from those patients. So RA disease progress uh, usually with, uh, usually it gets with synovial membrane inflammation, which lead to inflammatory cytokines, cytokines released where lead to erosion and damage to the joints, as well as uh, um, lead to other uh, um, like visceral damage that can happen with rheumatoid arthritis as well. So in, in the most updates about the diagnosis, so we used to say that the patient usually they do have to have, they have to have symptoms for at least six weeks uh, before uh, we diagnose them with rheumatoid arthritis. And this is where we have a change since 2010 in American College of Rheumatology 2010 update about the diagnosing criteria of rheumatoid arthritis. So this is an example where we used to have uh, 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 like uh, an early diagnosing criteria which can lead to uh, not diagnosing patient early. So here in this guy who had... Uh, symptoms of polyarthritis for more than four weeks. Um, if we go, uh, clinically, he had a bunch of swollen and tender joints, having high acute phase reactance, as well as anti-CCP, which is an antibody that we confirm a diagnosis with in rheumatoid arthritis patient. So and if you go to the old criteria, so we have to have at least six weeks to diagnose this patient. So this is where we have an update uh, about the new 2010 uh, diagnostic criteria of rheumatoid arthritis, where you can have even patient diagnosed earlier, less than six weeks, with even two large joints, not only small joints that we see with the, all the criteria. So the clinical presentation, it's a variable between articular uh, involving the joints, which lead to limitation of motion, malalignment uh, of the joints which lead to deformities and uh, uh, being disabled with using their joints. Uh, they usually do have morning stiffness, they get diffuse aches and pain, fever can be associated with rheumatoid as well. With a chronic inflammatory process, they can lose weight, they can get anemia, fatigue as we mentioned before, depression and malaise. So the extra articular uh, manifestation, including rheumatoid nodules, vasculitis, uh, pulmonary involvement, uh, as well as ocular involvement and uh, cardiac involvement in form of carditis, pericarditis, or myocarditis. So the clinical manifestation usually is in progress, progressive symmetrical polyarthritis. Usually the patient have early morning stiffness with high inflammatory markers. And this is what we need to look for in the labs as well. So the rheumatoid nodules, one of the extra articular manifestation, can go with the extensor surface uh, of the body as well as uh, the lung uh, can be uh, affected with this rheumatoid nodule. System, uh, vasculitis, which is mainly manifested as a skin uh, with a, a purpura crash, Usually, uh, this is uh, uh, not existing nowadays because of the early diagnosis, the early intervention, early management, which uh, an outcomes that's been prevented for almost 15 years now since the evolution of biologic therapy, as well as um, cervical involvement, what we call uh, 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 they can get uh, subluxation. And it has uh, an really impact on their uh, neck uh, symptoms and form of pain, as well as we need to do this uh, assessment before the OR, especially for patients going for general anesthesia. So those patients, they can develop uh, uh, subluxation, uh, which can lead to laqadrallah spinal injury if we don't screen those kind of patients. Uh, the ocular involvement in form of episcleritis or scleritis, as well as chagrin, secondary chagrin, where they can have a dryness of the eye. Most of the time, they feel their eye dry. So those patients, uh, up to 30 to 40 percent of patients with rheumatoid, they can develop this kind of manifestation. Pulmonary involvement in form of interstitial lung disease, it can be affected, and one of the most common lung uh, extra articular. Uh, manifestation of rheumatoid, 
as well as they can have pleural effusion. Cardiac, there is an increased chance of coronary artery disease with the long-term disease. Uh, GI in form of hepatotoxicity, uh, drugs can cause some hepatotoxicity manifestation. Splenomegaly associated with what we call it Felty's syndrome. In neurology, they can have carpal tunnel syndrome as well as mononeuritis multiplex. However, we don't see it quite common, especially this one, because this one associated with uh, vasculitis. Uh, and rheumatoid arthritis. We have to not forget to think about, think about uh, rheumatoid arthritis mimics, which can be uh, to other connective tissue disease like lupus, scleroderma, crystal induced polyarthropathy, especially in elderly patients who presented with small joints involvement. We have to think about what's called pseudogout, viral infection, which can lead to acute presentation of polyarthritis. Osteo, especially osteoarthritis, erosive inflammatory osteoarthritis can mimic rheumatoid, but however, it's totally different than rheumatoid in form of outcomes. Spondyloarthropathy, where it can involve axial and peripheral. Polymyalgia rheumatica and sarcoidosis also as a differential diagnosis. By this, I will leave the stage to uh, my colleague, Dr. Amir. So... I hope that I finished in time. Yes, alhamdulillah. Yes, you did. Great job. Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Abdelaziz. Um, it was a very informative uh, talk. Um, now, I think Dr. Amir is uh, preparing his slide. Are you ready, Dr. Amir? Yes, I'm ready. Great. Dr. Amir, um, Dr. Mohamed Amir is one of the very active rheumatologists in Saudi Arabia. Uh, it was a pleasure, and uh, I know him uh, years back where he was trying to have a registry for rheumatoid arthritis in Saudi Arabia. Uh, he did a great job, honestly, and it's a pleasure introducing him today to talk about the medication of uh, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, where actually it's uh, most of us, we shy away. It's a complicated way of saying the names, uh, how we pronounce uh, some of the, uh, uh, the drugs and uh, the doses and the frequencies. So it's a pleasure introducing you, Dr. Mohamed Ramir. Um, we are here actually to learn from you. Uh, the proper um, guidelines and the first and second and even third line of treatment for those medications. Uh, please, um, the podium is yours. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Dr. Fakhar, and uh, I would like to thank uh, everybody who has been behind uh, um, organizing this uh, activity. Um, I hope that uh, I will attract some of you to, uh, to uh, choose the rheumatology career that I've been uh, an advocate for since uh, uh, the last maybe 10 years. Um, uh, my talk is going to be um, on uh, biologics and small molecules uh, used in rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, and uh, uh, I like to, to use the, uh, the golden age or golden era of, of uh, rheumatoid arthritis as a title for my talk because we're really uh, blessed to have all of these medications. This is my disclosure. Uh, I have worked with uh, many pharmaceutical companies uh, related to uh, my specialties. And this is my agenda. So as Dr. Abdaz uh, said uh, and uh, highlighted clearly that rheumatoid arthritis is an important cause of uh, 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 disability, job loss, and premature mortality in the community. And uh, it uh, is the uh, uh, most important rheumatic disease in view of uh, burden both on the patient and the uh, society. And the prevalence uh, is about 1% and mainly were in uh, uh, peaking in the uh, working individuals. Now, uh, the revolution um, in the management of rheumatic disease in general and rheumatoid arthritis specifically uh, has uh, been uh, related to uh, uh, three main factors. Early diagnosis and management, introduction of highly effective biologics and small molecules, and the adaptation of three to target strategy. Um, now, the treat to target, uh, I'm sure that many of you are familiar because uh, the treat to target has been um, a long time ago adapted in the uh, diabetes, hypertension, and uh, um, uh, lipid uh, control uh, uh, specialties. 
Now, this is an important point that I would like to highlight, since Dr. Abdelaziz have shown you how rheumatoid arthritis um, can have an impact on the quality of life of patients, that we as rheumatologists, the aim of management is always to reach remission. We always try to make the patient symptom free and restore the function and quality of life and prevent any damage. Now, if we fail to achieve uh, this target, we go to low disease activity. So remission or low disease activity are the two main targets in managing RA patients. Saying that, once a patient achieves remission, you would like to reduce the therapy. And this is what I'm gonna show you in the, in the uh, most of the guidelines. Now, there is more interest uh, directed toward uh, patient reported outcomes and the management of comorbidities. And um, I think that we're all um, uh, going into a, a patient-centric uh, care that I'm a, a really big fan of. Now, these are the available therapies we have for the management of rheumatoid arthritis. We have corticosteroids, either oral or intraticular. We have the conventional DMARD, with the most important being methotrexate, lipilomamide, sulfasalazine, and hydroxychloroquine. We have the uh, TNF family, including five uh, biologics, infleximab, adilumab, etinercep, gulilumab, and sertuluzumab. And we have three non-TNF biologics, the toximab, abatacep, and tosolizumab. And we have um, three gens kinase inhibitors, including tofacitinib, baracitinib, and upadacitinib. Now, on um, the left side, you could see this is my supervisor um, who uh, I worked with, uh, who um, have not really enjoyed being a rheumatologist in the pre biological era where um, he had limited resources. Uh, he's very courageous. He likes to help his patients, but he did not have a lot of uh, options. On the other way around, I go to my clinic fully armed, uh, especially in our hospital where we have uh, almost all of the options and uh, we can really uh, 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 approach the patients into uh, and reaching a, a remission state. Now let's go to the originator biologics. Now, tumor necrosis factor alpha is an important uh, pro-inflammatory cytokine. It has not been involved on, only in RA, but any in uh, many uh, autoimmune diseases. Now, what is important in this uh, uh, cartoon that I would like to show you that TNF alpha um, is mainly secreted by macrophages, and some of it is by activated T lymphocytes. But at the same time, TNF alpha stimulates macrophages to secrete more TNF-alpha. The same is happening to T lymphocytes. So TNF-alpha just creates uh, um, uh, a media where you go into a vicious circle of more TNF, more induction of inflammation. Uh, now, general concept about the TNF family, first class of drugs approved. It is also approved for many, many indications like psoriatic arthritis, spondyloarthritis, inflammatory bowel diseases, uh, uh, non-infectious uh, uh, uveitis, and it has many uh, non-approved indications like cyclodose. Uh, better results with methotrexate, especially in view of drug survival, they require screening for latent tuberculosis, and the reason is that uh, once a, a, granule, um, uh, a mycobacteria is inhaled, the body either kills it or puts it into um, a granuloma, which is like a prison. And the, the gatekeeper of the granuloma is the tumor necrosis factor alpha. So once you block the TNF, you cause the granuloma to dissolve, then uh, uh, mycobacteria can uh, uh, multiply and uh, cause reactivation of TB. So we screen for latent TB and we treat uh, with INH or rifampicin or a combination. Uh, TNF-alpha uh, inhibitors are also shared with, with uh, many uh, serious infections, especially herpes zoster. It can precipitate heart failure in patients with um, uh, uh, history of decompensating heart failure, but it does not induce heart failure. It can cause drug-induced lupus from just formation of autoantibodies to a fully-blown uh, picture, and it can cause um, a very serious but rare manifestation, which is uh, brain demyelination, similar to multiple sclerosis. Now, um, if you could see an infliximab, adalimumab, sertuluzumab, and golimumab, 
they all are monoclonal antibodies. They are from the different origin, from murine or uh, mammalian cell expression or others. Um, there are some differences that I'm going to highlight on the on the next slide. Etanercept is a fusion protein, so it's like a, 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 a receptor that is uh, swimming in the sera, where it traps uh, TNF alpha uh, um, uh, reversibly. Now you can see that infliximab um, is the only drug that is available in Saudi Arabia as an intravenous. Gulilumab is available in some countries with the intravenous, but the rest are sub-Q. Um, um, it's very strange that Etnercept um, does not work in inflammatory bowel disease. Other, one, other four work very well in uh, infl inflammatory bowel disease. There are some primitive uh, explanation for that, which include uh, uh, the quantity of uh, TNF blockade that we need that is not given by etinercept or uh, the uh, membrane bound uh, TNF alpha that has a, a more important role, that, important role than the soluble one. Um, these are the uh, different uh, uh, um, structures of the anti-TNFs. So this is etinercept fusion protein where you have two TNF receptors flowing so it traps TNF here and here. You have the monoclonal antibody, the classical ones with the um, uh, FC and FAB uh, regions. You have infliximab, adalimumab, and gulilumab. Infliximab is a chimeric, adalimumab is uh, fully human, and sertuluzumab is uh, uh, a humanized. And you could see that sertuluzumab, uh, the FC portion has been taken out and it is uh, uh, enveloped in a pigulated uh, 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 protein where it uh, um, increases its size, so it reduces its placenta transfer and decreases its immunogenicity. The Tuximab is well known to everybody. It uh, it's, uh, uh, was initially developed for treatment of lymphoma. It chimeric monoclonal antibody which binds to the CD20 cell surface of B lymphocytes. So it depletes B lymphocytes. Um, uh, rituximab had a great success in the arthritis, especially the seropositive. So we don't use really rituximab in seronegative patients. Um, uh, it has better results with metroxate. And uh, when patients with RA have interstitial lung disease, Rituximab is a reasonable re, uh, option as anti-TNFs and some other medication can induce uh, pneumonitis. The main side effects of rituximab that I usually tell my patients are hypersensitivity reaction uh, uh, with the infusion and uh, a very rare uh, but uh, lethal complication which is called progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. So this is the rituximab and how it works. So uh, rituximab works both on the antibody dependent cell mediated cytotoxicity and the complement dependent uh, uh, cytotoxicity. It has some other effects uh, on T lymphocytes and the TH17 pathway uh, that are uh, of marginal value. The rituximab has um, uh, many of label used in rheumatology, including lupus. Uh, Sjogren's syndrome, stomach fluorosis, carboglobinium, uh, polymyositis, dermatomyositis, and EGPA. Abatacept um, is actually one of the first drugs that have been developed specifically for rheumatoarthritis. And abatacept is uh, uh, sept is a fusion protein, but it has an antibody part, including to its fusion protein part. And basically, you have uh, what we called co-stimulation of uh, uh, T cells uh, by antigen presenting cells. So T cells are dormant uh, till inflammation occur and antigen presenting cells engulf the uh, either the exogenous uh, antigen or the autoantigen, then they presented to awake the T cell that plays the major role and the central role in the inflammation rheumatoid arthritis. So you have the MHC T cell receptor um, uh, stimulation, you have the CD8086 and CD28. So abatacept blocks the CD8086 um, uh, region where it uh, prevents um, the uh, uh, full cost stimulation so the T cell becomes dormant or stays dormant and uh, there is no uh, much inflammation. Abatacept is available in a sub q and, and intravenous route. Um, the next drug is interleukin-6 blocker and uh, we have two of them. Just to highlight IL-6 as an important pro-inflammatory cytokine, it has a pleiotropic effect 
where it uh, does not only work on the joints, it also has uh, an effect on the liver, um, on the uh, bone marrow, and um, on the bone density. We have two drugs. We have tocilizumab, and uh, I'm sure that many of you um, are hearing about uh, 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 the effect of tocilizumab on uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, 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 cytokine uh, uh, storm, uh, which uh, IL-6 plays an important role. And there are many uh, ongoing, there are like 20 uh, randomized controlled trials going for tocilizumab in uh, uh, in COVID-19. Similarly, sarilumab uh, is a fully human uh, monoclonal antibody against IL-6. Uh, they both have a very potent effect on anemia and uh, the reduce acute phase reactants. Um, uh, they, they, they need the similar screening for um, uh, TNF inhibitors. Now, what has been observed with uh, tocilizumab and serlumab that can increase the lipid profile, but what, which I really believe that it is not a uh, harmful increase, and maybe uh, uh, Dr. Daniel can talk about that. Um, uh, the IL-6 blockers were the first uh, group of medication that uh, work uh, very well with and without methotrexate. Uh, and uh, as we have a soluble and a membrane-bound uh, uh, TNF, we have a soluble and membrane-bound uh, interleukin-6 receptor. So uh, both block uh, the uh, IL-6 receptor where, where it is, and it, uh, 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 which will eventually cause a blockade of both the classical membrane signaling and the trans uh, signaling. Now, um, as you know, biologics um, are very expensive. The cost of biologics per month is about 30,000 to 5,000 uh, real per month. Um, uh, many of them now are out of patency, including uh, uh, adalilumab, where you can see that we have 10 registered adalilumab biosimilars in the European Union. You have uh, six registered tuximab biosimilars in the European Union, and you have four uh, infliximab biosimilars and uh, two alternative uh, biosimilars. Uh, many of them are now registered in the Saudi FDA. We're very proud that the Saudi FDA is one of the leaders, uh, regulatory bodies in the world uh, to develop biosimilar guidelines. Uh, they developed it in 2010, a long time ago, and uh, uh, it was really at the same time with the, as the uh, US one. Now let's go to the final uh, group of medication. We have the small molecules. You, all of the medication that I have talked about, they work extracellularly. So they, 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 they work on the cytokines that are outside the cells or they work on cell uh, uh, surface receptors. Now the small molecules, basically uh, uh, the genus kinase inhibitors, we have three. We have tofasnib, barasnib, yupatasnib. Uh, uh, Tofasnib is a JAK1 uh, and 3, but has some JAK2 uh, effect. Barisnib is so JAK1 and 2, and Upatisnib is, a, is a, almost a pure JAK1. And we have um, uh, one more that is coming on the way. They express their effect on intracellular transducer and activator transcription with STAT, uh, which generate gene expression and protein production, leading to maintaining of inflammation. So basically, the JAK. Uh, work on many cytokines, not only on one cytokine. There's, their efficacy is similar to biologics. They need similar screening. And uh, two specific adverse events related to JAX uh, are herpes zoster and development of DBT and PE. You could see here that many uh, cytokines uh, are uh, blocked by JAX, uh, which unfortunately does not include TNF. That would be really interesting to see that. Um, uh, just of note, uh, there have been some studies where they have uh, done a double blockade of two different uh, uh, cytokines. It didn't really add much in view of the efficacy and it added some uh, adverse events. So um, blocking more cytokines doesn't mean um, having a better effect. Um, now, I would like to have your undivided attention because many of you are pharmacists and I'm sure that many of you are um, holding important positions in their uh, departments, in uh, their hospitals. Now, the question, 
do you really need all of these medications? Now, uh, when I joined the hospital, uh, I had the pleasure to work on introducing about seven or eight of, of the medication uh, that I have mentioned um, uh, uh, in my presentation to the hospital. And um, it's not that you need one drug of each class. The, the simple reason is this important study. Um, this is a systematic review on 200,000 patients from both randomized controlled trials, from registries, and it just show you the drug survival of the first biology. So after six months, 20% of patients will lose their first biology. After one year, a quarter, and after uh, three years, almost half of the patients, okay? So when we see rheumatoid arthritis patients, we are in a dynamic, uh, change of these medications. And, and drug survival is not about safety and efficacy only. This is a really a narrow vision. You have a lot of cause of drug loss. You have adverse events, you have inefficacy, the two important ones, but you have other ones like adherence, health coverage for uh, expatriates, conception for women, uh, patients' decisions, and uh, other ones. Now, if we look at the guidelines, I'm just going to take you very quickly on the guidelines. So, so this is phase one. You have a clinical diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis, okay? And you could see the importance of metrixate in the guidelines, where the first question you ask yourself, is there a contraindication to metrixate or there is no contraindication? Metrixate is by far the most important drug in rheumatoid arthritis management because metrixate, uh, um, uh, controls the disease in about 30 to 40 percent of patients. Okay, so if a patient responds to metrixate, he does not need to go to any of these expensive biologics. The, 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 the price of metrixate per month is about 60 reals. So we start a metrixate um, dose which is optimized uh, either by the, the, the dosing or the route. So the usual dose we use is 15 to 20 milligram. Uh, Sub-Q is superior uh, uh, to oral by about 20%. The bioavailability is more by 20%. Splitting the dose of metrixate also adds to the bioavailability and is, is uh, uh, very close to the Sub-Q form. We always combine um, the um, uh, management of uh, newly diagnosed RA patients with short course, course of steroids. We can combine them with, with other DMAs like riflenamide, sulfasalazine, uh, hydroxychloroquine because it's very weak effect has been taken off from uh, the 2019 guideline that has been there for a long time. Then we re-evaluate it always after three to six months. We, we see if a patient achieve um, a response. If the patient does not achieve a response and the patient has a poor prognostic factor, we go directly to a biologic or a, a GNS kinase inhibitors. If the, the, there are no uh, poor prognostic factors, which are um, highly uh, positive rheumatoid factor in aqua, uh, high disactivity in the form of uh, more than 16 swollen joints and failing uh, more conventional DMR. You can always optimize the DMR by giving combination or giving another cause of steroids. Once the patient improves, you go to this very important part, which is dose reduction interval uh, increase in patients using IV medication and sustained remission. And the goal is to achieve a drug-free remission. Drug-free remission is achieved in about 5 to 10% um, uh, of patients uh, in registries. Then if a patient fails, you go to the uh, second biologic or genes kinase is better. Then you go to the third and you try to maintain whatever uh, disease state you have achieved. This is again a very important uh, study from uh, uh, Sweden. And uh, it shows you uh, the trade-off, the, the best second trade-off we had in, in, in rheumatoid arthritis. You could see cohort one from 96 to 99, this is the pre-biological era where the direct cost was 29% and the indirect cost, and the indirect cost is meaning the absenteeism, the disability, the, the, the real effect on the society. Uh, uh, going into the biological era, you could see that the direct cost has increased, of course, because of the cost of biologics, but on the price of reducing disability and uh, 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 loss of productivity in patients, uh, which is about uh, 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 an 8% decrease. 
this is the best second best trade off now the best trade off would be an improved uh, or redu reduction in the indirect cost without an increase in direct cost and this is what uh, hopefully biosimilars uh, will uh, will be of value in uh, 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 the uh, uh, markets that um, have introduced it. Um, I would like also to show you this systematic review that was just uh, published uh, uh, about two months ago, which shows you this is in a chronological um, uh, order. You could see that the drug cost has dramatically increased over time. And this 2016 is the time where biosimilars has been introduced. And I, I hope that in the future, we're going to see a reduction in the, in, the, in the drug cost. You can see that the inpatient has clearly uh, diminished. The outpatient care has also diminished. And the other um, forms of care, including surgeries and others, have been uh, also reduced dramatically. So the predominant cost in RA management in these days is the drug cost. So in conclusion, the introduction of biologics and small molecules with different mechanisms of action have led to a dramatic improvement we need um, as much as medication as possible because we are always in a dynamic change uh, once we achieve remission uh, or uh, a patient has a flare or has another reason to change his medication. Disease profile and adverse events are important to consider when choosing an agent, these patients. Indirect cost was dramatically reduced on the price of in the increasing uh, direct cost. And this will hopefully might change with the introduction of biosimilars. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, to Dr. Al-Amir. Very informative uh, presentation. And uh, the guidelines were actually given in a very smooth way. Uh, I think it's even easy to memorize. Uh, thank you very much. And we'll uh, delay all the questions uh, for you and Dr. Abdelaziz at the end of the session, inshallah. Uh, and now it's a pleasure to introduce Dr. Adania. Uh, Dr. Dania Moti, she is a consultant cardiologist. Uh, she is uh, our colleague uh, in King Faisal uh, Specialized Hospital. Uh, she will tell us about now the combination of rheumatoid arthritis in cardiovascular complications. Uh, this is uh, actually the major uh, topic uh, of our uh, webinar today. It's how to introduce rheumatoid arthritis to our cardiac uh, specialized people. And I think we're going to learn a lot from you, Dr. Dania. So, it's yours now. Assalamu uh, alaikum. Uh, good evening, everybody. It was it was my honor to be uh, for the first time in uh, with the Saudi Association of Rheumatology, and uh, it uh, actually it was a challenge for me because the last time I talked about this topic was a few years ago. Uh, so I would like uh, to thank the three societies: the Saudi Heart Association and the the. Uh, the uh, Saudi Society of Rheumatology and also the Saudi Pharmaceutical Society. And I don't have no conflict of interest related to this talk. Uh, however, I would like to thank especially uh, Dr. Afakhar. And I think we can say today, Aid Milad Saeed, for uh, uh, our colleagues who had this tremendous effort to do, to make happen this, uh, this presentation. So before, uh, before delaying, I would like just as Dr. Abdelaziz told you, it's a commonest cause of autoimmune inflammatory polyarthritis. And it's 1% on the Caucasian. I couldn't find any percentage in Middle East or King Saudi Arabia. I think this is the project of uh, uh, our uh, colleague in rheumatology to find the real prevalence and incidence in kingdom. And the peak age of onset is between 35 and 55 years old, with the predominance of female three over one. Now, when I was start looking at, of course, the first step when you start looking uh, to preparing a talk, you look at PubMed. And when I looked at rheumatoid arthritis and cardiovascular risk, uh, as far as for today, it was 2,913 publication. But don't worry, I will not go over all of these. I, I was trying, I tried to summarize the actual literature. Heart is involved in, at all levels in rheumatoid arthritis patient at the level of systolic uh, dysfunction, myocardial level, pericardial level, valvular level, vascular level, especially the ischemic heart disease, which we'll more talk about it today. And of course, at electrical complications, such as sudden death and electrical. Uh, uh, why discussing RA and cardiovascular complication today? 
Uh, RA is a chronic inflammatory disease, as you know, and I put it really inflammatory in red because this is the really link between our both uh, specialties. And it's associated with increased risk of cardiovascular morbidity and mortality, as I will show you as far as we go in the, on the meetings, predominantly due to the accelerated and premature atherosclerosis on this patient. Uh, life expectancy is therefore shortened in RA patient versus age, gender, and cardiovascular risk factor matched persons. Now, I will start with the clinical scenario, and I would like you to be attentive and uh, listening very well to this talk because I have a question for you. In 2006, this is a real case that I have uh, faced uh, back in France when I used to work there three years ago. He's a young, 48 years old male, diagnosed with RA with the criteria that Dr. Abdelaziz told you about. He's a not heavy smoker, only one more box since 10 years. He's only 90 kilos, normal, almost normal weight for here, and uh, height 1.8. Blood pressure is reasonable, 130 over 75, and no really uh, other signs of cardiac or uh, other heart failure disease. The total cholesterol was borderline, and the HDL was 45 milligram. The glucose was almost borderline, but it's acceptable, and renal profile was normal, and he has a high burden activity of the disease, and he was treated by methotrexate and prednisolone. The first question for you, and I would like uh, Bilal to be with us to pull the question for us. What do you think the estimate risk of his having his uh, first cardiovascular event within 10 years for this patient, for Jean-Pierre? Is it 1 to 5% at 10 years, 5 to 10% or 10 to 15% or more than 15 years? Or I'm not sure of that. I prefer to respond at the end of this lecture. Yalla, uh, I would like to, I, you have only maybe 10 seconds so that I would like to be on time. Please respond, go and submit your, your answers in, within 10 seconds. Um, so um, remember, he's a uh, 10 box of smoking. He's a male, 48 years. Can Bilal, can we see if most of the patients respond? Excellent. So uh, it's almost divide between all of you and some people were honest and they said, I'm not sure I prefer to respond, which is a good answer also. So let me show you now how we calculate this risk of this patient. Basically, if you are relied to the American College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association, you have many, many uh, ways of calculating the risk calculator. Both, many of them are already on your smartphone or on the internet and you can just open the application and you put the information you have. You have the gender, the age, the race, the total cholesterol, the HDL cholesterol, the systolic blood pressure. You put if he has a uh, high blood pressure or he has diabetes or he's a smoker and then you click calculate and then uh, he will give you the risk factor of this patient almost 9%, 8.9%, 10 years of having a cardiovascular event. Uh, and this is actually in a class one recommendation for any adults more than 40 years to 75 that we should assess routinely traditional cardiovascular factor at 10 years for this patient. This is class one means everybody should do it with or without arthritis. Now, and this application is giving you also guidelines basically to suggest any treatment as whether the aspirin or statin or something. And uh, th so this is nice. Now, if you see all the papers in rheumatology, I, I think you are aware that the priming risk score was most, most, time, most of the time used for this uh, uh, predicting cardiovascular risk. And actually it's also seated in the guidelines. I put it for you the first one because it's the one that uh, most recent one but also you can see here it was given 8%. So it's not very difficult. Now, uh, I will get, uh, keep uh, the story of this patient. Uh, in 2012, so six years later, the treatment was increased because of increased disease burden and activity. Methotrexate was increased. Prednisolone was uh, almost five milligram per day. And anti-TNF inhibitors were added. The blood pressure increased a little bit. The cholesterol, I did not find it on the chart. And he has a, a much increased marker of inflammation. And after this active phase and treated uh, two weeks ago, he was admitted in our hospital, in our department for uh, cardiac arrest uh, re that revealed acute coronary syndrome with acute MI with total occlusion of the LAD. And the primary PCI, he was resuscitated and primary PCI was done and uh, he was still alive. So the question for you, my colleague who are connected here, in 2006, what was his estimated risk of cardiac dying, of dying from cardiac cause at 10 years? The first time you calculate the cardiovascular event. Now we want to calculate, Allah Samah Allah, his risk of cardiac death at 10 years. Is it 1%, 3 to 4%, or 5 to 9%, or 10 to 14%, or more than 15%, or again, I'm not sure. Let's خلي على الله ونسيف لنسأل cardiologist. So please respond so that you can make it more interactive to see what are the gaps in your 
uh, knowledge about this or maybe what we can add today on your, what you know already about it. So Bilal, can you show us maybe after 10 seconds the uh, different response for this patient, for this question? So remember the risk of dying. Okay, so here we can see again, 25% are very wisdom and they do not, they don't want to respond as most of the people say between uh, five to 9% at 10 years. Let's see if this is, we can just uh, guess it or there's a way of calculation. And again here, you can see here, we go back to Europe and in Europe we have uh, what we call the score chart, which is uh, another way of calculating and estimating the 10 year risk of fatal cardiovascular death. At this time while we're estimating the cardiovascular death in population, there's two charts, one for high risk cardiovascular risk and one for low countries, low where the low cardiovascular risk like the Mediterranean. I think Saudi Arabia belongs to the high cardiovascular risk because of the lifestyle type of living. And if we look here, it's more visual than the previous one. It's also you can do it by uh, internet or by your smartphone, but most of the time it's a chart. You look at the age here. This is man, this is woman, and he's a smoker. So we go there here. He's 48, so somewhere in here between 48 and 50. And he, you look at the cholesterol, remember, it's 220, so somewhere here. So it's around between three to four percent. So most of the people were wrong to say it's 10 percent to die because he has actually remember he has to have a cardiovascular event. It was nine percent. So to die from it is of course less than that. So basically, uh, the, the problem of these two uh, charts that they, they did not take in account the RA as a disease itself. And actually, when you look at the ACC and AHA guidelines, they look at RA or psoriasis or lupus as risk enhancing factors. So it increased the risk of cardiovascular death. So this two chart, you might tell me that does not work. You may be right. And actually, even the fact that he has high CRP is also another enhancing factors for this patient. So what the, the, what the European decided to do, they, they, they found a consensus way to better estimate the risk of a rheumatoid, a rheumatic patient and what they did, when they did multiply by two, they found they were overestimating the risk of cardiovascular death. So they decided to multiply by 1.5, the score that you obtained by the chart score. In other way, if we calculate or this patient was 4% at 10 years to die, it will be because he has RA, his risk will automatically be 6%. It is 2A classification, recommendation. So it's really reasonable and it was uh, according to uh, uh, difference between uh, expected and observed mortality on this patient. So now, to be honest, please, another question for you, and I will start, I will leave you alone for a while. How often do you assess routinely cardiovascular risk score of your RA patient? Um, every year, every five years, be honest, or early 10 years after RA diagnosis, only when I use high dose of corticosteroid, or no need, my patients are often young female, or I don't know how to assess it, actually which we have seen 25% already said that they're not, they're not sure about how to assess it. So Bilal, thank you for pulling the question. And I would like to see the audience. It's a easy question, so maybe only 10 seconds. Okay, can you have the question, the answers now? Okay, so it's uh, every year 35, excellent. So we are good on it, excellent. Every five years, 20%, and I don't know how to assess, so again, exactly the same percentage. One fourth of you don't know how to assess it, and I thank you, Anna, maybe I will be helpful and useful for this 25%. So now, back to these uh, things. To, to the lecture. Actually, I want to show you a very important study showing you that not only in Saudi Arabia, but also in Canada in the very nice cohort. Here, this study was published in 2016 using two big cohorts, the one pre-biological at the initial diagnosis and one after biological treatment. And actually what this study tells us is that the risk for the Framingham here risk score was not calculated for almost 134%, almost 90% of the population. Moreover, it tells us that the percentage of traditional cardiovascular risk factor was almost 20, present in almost 23% or 20, more than 20% of the patient, including smoking, uh, diabetes was less, 
and dyslipidemia almost 15%, and obesity more than 25 So it tells us also, actually using uh, 11 cardiovascular quality indicator of these two cohorts, that the adherence to this uh, indicator was very poor, actually, in, uh, as part of the communication, and as part of the cardiovascular risk assessment, calculation of the cardiovascular risk, and also communicating the documentation, actually, of this cardiovascular risk factors, communication with the primary physician or with the cardiologist when obesity or high blood pressure was found, or even discussion. It was very bad It was very, uh, when, when it comes to discuss risk of benefit of corticosteroid in high-risk RA patient. So this study shows that the, ETA, the state, actually the state uh, of what's going on in the world. So it's not only in Canada. I think it reflects many other uh, countries. So actually cardiovascular disease has major impact on RA patient outcome. As you can see here, the rate of stroke, MI, or stroke or MI, or even sudden death or heart failure are significantly increased almost more than two-fold, almost six-fold was a sudden death because of the ischemic heart disease. Uh, and actually, it was concerned almost exactly like as you have diabetes. So if you have RA, it's 1.7-fold increase in cardiovascular events, exactly like diabetes. It has, as it's been, has been shown in this study in 2011, multiplied by 1.6 and 1.7. And you know that diabetes for us is like a cancer. We are really, really very careful for this patient. The risk of dying of MI is um, an, um, is. Uh, augmented is increased by 40% in this huge study as comparing to a non-rheumatic uh, non patient. Now, when you take all this uh, event on account, of course, uh, this is a study from Mayo Clinic, the observed uh, mortality is much lower than the expected one, and it's mainly due to the uh, uh, cardiovascular disease. Now, why do RA patients have increased risk of cardiovascular disease? Because not only they have the traditional risk factor that we are having and our population are having in cardiology, but also because they have other untraditional risk factors that are proper to this disease itself, which is the, act, the inflammation, the disease activity, and the disease burden. And actually, because life is not very easy, when somebody has one risk factor traditional, usually they have more than three recurring in almost 17% of the population. So somebody have his male, and usually he smokes and usually have hypertension or have diabetes. So unfortunately, life is unfair. Now, I want you to remember something is very important. Sometimes we forget to ask about it, but this is very important in RA patient. Ask about premature family history of CAD in your patient because because these patients are young, and when you have a premature CAD less uh, than 50, occurring less than 50 years, you have three times standardized SMR mortality ratio for people to, uh, to die. Uh, and to have a cardiovascular event as compared to those who do not have family history. Now, another thing which is very bizarre, and this is, I found it very difficult, different from our population, is that low BMI in this, in this uh, disease is paradoxically associated with lower survival. Usually in cardiology, the more you have, the more you have BMI or how you are obese, the more you have cardiovascular event. And here, low BMI in RA patient might be related to the more inflammatory burden during active phase of the disease. So it does not protect you to be thin on this disease, especially during the active phase. And not only this patient had actually a traditional risk factor at baseline when they start their disease, but also they increase over time here, over three years on this study, increasing the incidence rate of hypertension, diabetes, and hyperlipidemia, probably because of the aging or also because of the medication they are using. Now, why this excess risk of death from cardiovascular cause? What is common between a cardiologist and rheumatology disease and heart disease and risk factor is that we have inflammation. And I found this editorial nice. The title was Rheumatoid Arthritis is a Human Model of Inflammation. So really, really, it explained very well how this links between the inflammation and rheumatic disease and heart disease. Let me spend one more a little bit more time on the link between arthritis and atherosclerosis. Here, uh, Dr. Abdelaziz and Dr. Omer explain very well for you that our RA patients start with systemic inflammation, with activation of the macrophage, secretion of a lot of pro-inflammatory cytokine, pro amino complex, macrophage, interleukin. This is like a Chernobyl basically on their body, and all this has impact on the skeletal muscle, which decreases functional capacity, insulin resistance, uh, activity on the liver, increase of CRP production, which is also pro-inflammatory again and again. It's like circle versus circle, and augmentation of the synthesis of proprocoagulant, altered of the lipid levels, quantitative
quantitatively and qualitatively. The decrease of HDL, decrease of the total cholesterol, the change of the composition of the lipid particle and increasing of the small particles, they are more pro-atherogenic, pro and uh, alteration, alteration of the adipose tissue going to central fat and lean fat. All leads actually, of course, to hypercoagulable state, ruptured atherosclerotic plaque, and a cardiovascular event. And now you can see here at the cellular level that the, the players, the game, are almost the same cells on the RA synovium and on the arterial wall with the macrophage activation, the foam cells, and uh, all this inflammatory mediator being almost the same on both diseases. So uh, I, will, I would like also to explain you, you asked me why this total cholesterol decrease. Actually, there is also another motion that is very important today. It's the lipid paradox in RA patient. Usually when we have a high lipid profile in cardiology, we have more likely to have cardiac events or to die from cardiovascular events. Here it's totally the opposite. In pre-RA, this patient, they have high cardiovascular risk despite lower lipid profile, especially during the uh, activation, during active phase of the disease. The rate of of cardiovascular will increase while the total cholesterol and HDL cholesterol will decrease along with increase of the CRP and other inflammatory markers. And this is due of the de decrease of the HDL efflux capacity to the liver, uh, the augmentation of the small dense LDL particles, uh, decrease of the um, uh, uh, sorry, increase of the atherogenic index and the LPA, etc. So during the untreated phase, you have all these parameters that are decreased, the CRP is increased, and when you treat the patient, they will go to the baseline level. So it's basically better to have almost a normal or high uh, HDL cholesterol and LDL. The level of inflammation is related to cardiovascular death, and this year PRP predicts very well mortality and cardiovascular events at uh, 10 years. Now, what are the tools to assess cardiovascular in, our, in, in RA patients? We have, I told you about the clinical tools, clinical, the personal and family history of the patient, the cardiovascular risk score that I told you about, and we have also the ankle brachial index, the ABI, which is very easy, the troponin levels, we have the imaging tool, carotid ultrasound, echocardiography at rest, and an exercise, and the calcium scoring by non-cons. I will not be able to cover all the things, but to give you an idea, what is the ankle brachial, because everybody can do it, poor and rich uh, people. Uh, this is ABI is a very simple and non-invasive clinical tool to diagnose yourself peripheral artery disease, which is surrogate marker of diffuse atherosclerosis and surrogate uh, of uh, coronary artery disease. Normal ABA is between 1 and 1 1.4. I will explain maybe in the discussion why how to do it. And actually when it was more than 1.4, it's more related to more calcified in diabetes patient, for instance. Now, why I'm talking about this one? Because actually this ABI index improved the positive predictive value of framing score in assessing cardiovascular mortality. And you can see here uh, with this uh, curves, the more, uh, if you add the ABI to the cardiovascular score, your uh, risk of estimating is much improved. Now, the recommendation of RAC, it is not, uh, it's not me, it's the ULAR, it's the League, European League of Rheumatitis. You have to do, assess the modified score system by multiplying by 1.5. In RA, asymptomatic RA patient, you have to do the ankle brachial index to rank as indicated an asymptomatic RA, even at intermediate risk. And you have to do it annually for high-risk patients, which are positive, actively, extra-articular symptoms, and metabolic syndrome or longer disease more than 10 years or more than 50 years. So this is really a recommendation from your society. Now, one word about the ultra-sensitive, um, uh, hypersensitive troponin. It's increased in RA patient independently of the presence of any cardiovascular risk factor or inflammation or during the disease. The elevated, very low, low level, but elevated troponin concentration without heart failure may indicate there is, there, there is subclinical indolent myocardial injury going on here in this patient. Now, what are the particularity of ischemic heart disease in RA patient? The risk of developing CAD appears very early as the diagnosis is made in younger people, which is very rare in our population. Our population starts uh, later. RA patients have often three vessel disease, no, uh, and typical angina is uncommon. This is, we don't know why. They don't feel the angina like we have it in our uh, clinic. Myocardial function is often silent, and that's why we have a high rate of sudden cardiac death. So the rate of uh, uh, unrecognized MI, as you can see, is much higher in RA patient. And the primary PCI is less offered when compared to control, maybe because of this inflammation problem, cardiologists are afraid. And therefore, the mortality is twofold increased on this patient, especially in, uh, in female and in male. Now, uh, 
uh, one word about carotid uh, plaque. The carotid atrotor has been also been a tool to estimate the risk of this patient. As you can see, the more the antimamedia thickness is increased, the more the risk of having events in RA patient is increased in two cohorts, very big cohorts, the cardio has, cardiovascular health study and the oral study in more than 600, they performed carotid ultrasound, which is very easy. And also the presence in carotid bilateral plaque is also a predictor of, uh, of survival at uh, 10 years. Now, when we looked at all that, eventually when you have ischemic heart disease, you have diastrid dysfunction. But even if you don't have, we have found that this is a meta-analysis showing that in our A patient, including 25 study, 5,000 people, compared to 1,600, they have diastolic dysfunction as assessed by the left atrial volume, which is increased, higher LV mass, which means hypertrophy, higher pulmonary hypertension, and higher uh, uh, grade two diastolic function. And when we looked at the, uh, sorry, what we look at the, uh, uh, sorry, uh, what we look at the alteration of myocardial strain by echo at rest, we can see, so even when the, uh, ejection fraction is normal, you can have alteration actually on the global longitudinal strain, which is another tool to assess the systolic function before the occurrence of decrease of ejection fraction. We'll go later on the discussion if needed, you want to know what is the GLS. Now, when you have the aesthetic dysfunction or you have subclinical alteration of the GLS, you may have atrial fibrillation and eventually stroke. And the risk, in fact, in RA patient is 40% increased in a, of, a, of having atrial fibrillation as compared to general population. And and therefore, the risk of stroke is increased by 30% in RA patient. So there's a lot of comorbidity also. Uh, accordingly, when you have this all uh, abnormalities, you, the, the risk of heart failure is obviously increased. And you can see here from different study that the RA patient will develop uh, a lot of heart failure irrespective when adjusting for age, with presence of ischemic heart disease and other factors. And the cumulative incidence of dying from ha uh, heart failure is much higher in RA versus no RA patient for the same disease. Moreover, and this is very important, this is very important, RA patients are more likely to have heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. And this is an entity which is 50% actually in our population. And sometimes we rely only on ejection fraction. We say, okay, ejection fraction is normal, go home. No, this patient will develop truly heart failure, they will die, and the mortality in RA patient is much higher as compared to no RA patient. And the odd of preserved EF was almost twice and no RA patient. So basically not looking only of the ejection fraction, but looking also at all this HFPF activity. So what is the RA patient cardiovascular picture now? They have premature cardiovascular mortality and morbidity because of what? Because of increased risk factor, because of uh, uh, paradoxical lipid profile, decreased physical activity, increased systemic inflammation, increased arterial stiffness, more diastolic dysfunction, and increased risk of AFib and stroke, increased risk of acute coronary syndrome, and MI, and therefore sudden cardiac death, and increased risk of heart failure. So basically, they are very, very high risk patients, and we have to really to treat them as much as the other. What is the impact of RA treatment on cardiovascular event? I think Dr. Amar gave you a very nice overview on all this medication about the, uh, <clears throat> the effect. Or I don't know. I don't think he he. Um, talk a lot about moderate and high intensity exercise, but I will try to summarize, summarize, summarize all, all uh, many, many study about interleukin, 10 weeks. I cannot go over all this one. And there is a nice meta-analysis from Camille Rubil in Canada, uh, summarizing everything which I'm trying to show you here, basically, in one slide. I hide almost 10 slides to show you that high to moderate intensity physical activity is very beneficial in this patient, and it does not cause more damage to the joint or to the disease itself. No steroidal use are harmful for the heart. Glucocorticoids are late on time and dose dependent, and they could be harmful because of the diabetes induced and hypertension. Methotrexate looks to, seems to be beneficial, and hydroxylochloroquine is neutral as far as I see. Sulfazine also. Uh, TNF inhibitors are beneficial, and all specifically when you use in B therapy with methotrexate. Other non TNF biological are beneficial, and we don't have much data about the JAK inhibitors, the tofacitinib, or other small molecular target therapy. So we, it seems to be beneficial actually through actually. Um, 
uh, surrogate marker of the disease here, for instance, in this study recently stated in 2019, uh, the tofacitinib, sorry, it's very difficult to pronounce, even after 24 weeks of uh, treatment, the improvement, there was improvement of surrogate marker of cardiovascular, which is the HDL cholesterol. And we know, I told you, when you improve, improve the HDL, patient outcome will improve. So it's indirect beneficial. And when you're waiting. Now, what is the impact of cardiovascular treatment on RA patient? This study from Norway shows you that actually 36% of RA patients has an indication for lower lipid territory. Among those, only 62 received the treatment, and only 20% of those reached the goals, most likely because of the inflammatory disease burden of the disease. Now, what uh, the role of, uh, of statin? Actually, here the study is neutral almost. You need to treat 121 by atrovastatin to have an event, and the event rate was very, very low. And actually, uh, it was not uh, the p value did not reach the significant value. There is no uh, role actually in in asymptomatic RA patient with this disease. Now, if you have, uh, we have guidelines for this one, the European and the American, and we have guidelines when to give this medication cystatin. And exactly in RA patient or in no RA patient, basically, when you have a cardiovascular risk score more than 5% and LDL cholesterol more than 2.6 millimole, yes for statin. So it does you know, not work much on HDL. You know that the effect is limited, but on LDL. So if your patient of RA patient has more than 2.6 and he has high risk score, then yes, go for it and give statin and it will improve his outcome. How about Antihypertensive drugs, you know the definition of hypertension, it's same as us, uh, even we go even lower and lower now in the United States. All the combinations are possible, all medication works in decreasing the blood pressure. However, we prefer usually the ACE inhibitors or the RB or to, in combination with the diuretics or another one, just as dual combination from the beginning uh, because of better adherence and fixed molecule. So the beta blockers are more mainly for those who has acute infarction or an angina or heart failure patient. Now, last question, my dear, to see if you are still with me. Should we give aspirin after 10 years of RA or induce more than 50 years all patient are a patient. Yes, no, or I'm not sure. Yeah, I give you only five seconds because I don't have more time. I have more two slides more to go. So shall we give aspirin for patient with RA more than 50 years and more than 10 years of disease burden? Bilal, show us the result now. Okay, yes, excellent. So I'm, I'm here. I, I think I'm, it's been useful. Thank you very much for your answer. Actually, there is no role of aspirin for primary prevention on RA patients unless they have a cardiovascular event. So yes, for secondary prevention, as you can see, if they did a stroke or a MI or uh, any, any other events, but no, in primary prevention, there's no, it's more harmful, actually. This is a summary of all what I told you, which is a summary of recommendation by the European League of Rheumatitis and the take-home message, tight disease control with the best available RA drug that Mohammed told about you. As Assess cardiovascular risk annually after or after change of treatment regimen. Caution in patients with low cholesterol level and low LDL and low BMI because it might indicate high disease activity. Use the lowest dose of glucocorticoid, avoid no steroid, methotrexate NF inhibitors, and triple use significant survival benefit. Manage closely traditional risk factors, stop smoking, treat hypertension with RASI. Start a statin only in moderate and high risk patients with long standing RA more than 10 years or high disease activity and no aspirin for migraine prevention. And I think the most important thing is a better communication and collaboration between rheumatologists and the cardiologists. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Dania. Thank you. Thank you very much for our uh, speakers. Um, we have a few questions that came from the audience. I hope we can cover with the 20 minutes coming uh, most of the questions. Uh, the first question would be sent to Dr. Abdelaziz. They are asking you about uh, the anti-CCP in diagnosing of rheumatoid arthritis. What is the role of it? And the other thing, how relevant we can count on it? Dr. Abdelaziz, unmute your mic, please. So let me just, uh, the question is for anti-CCP presence in patients with polyarthritis, this is uh, more than 95% is rheumatoid arthritis. So the question now, the, the, the one that's been touched by Dr. Amir, so there is an entity what's called seronegative rheumatoid arthritis, where you don't see anti-CCP positive, but they are, they are rheumatoid patients. So anti-CCP is a guidance, uh, help us in diagnosing, but does not rule out uh, rheumatoid. 
The question also for the same thing is that uh, how relevant is the first line agent of uh, treating rheumatoid arthritis in these patients? Dr. Lamir. Seronegative uh, rheumatoid arthritis, the first line uh, of drugs, is it effective in these cases or is it not? So basically, um, treating seronegative rheumatoid arthritis is almost uh, similar to seropositive, except in some instances, like I have mentioned, in using rituximab. So when you go on the, on the uh, ULAR uh, uh, protocol, it does not really mention is there a difference between seropositive and seronegative. So um, uh, we treat them exactly the same. And the notion that seronegative RA is a milder form of disease and uh, you need to be conservative with these patients is actually a wrong statement and I'm totally against it. We are aggressively treating both subtypes because you don't know which uh, patient has a more rapidly progressive disease. By statistics and um, uh, evidence, seropositive is more, but uh, we don't take these uh, risks in our patients. Um, clear. Dr. Ablaziz, you talked about the dry eye and uh, it could be an indication for rheumatoid arthritis. They need uh, more explanation from your side regarding that. Okay, so rheumatoid arthritis can associate with Sjogren, what's called Sjogren syndrome, which is a secondary. It can be associated with rheumatoid, lead to dry eye, dry mouth. And uh, there is also uh, rheumatoid as uh, they can develop dry eye. That's not significant like the patient with Sjogren, as well as drug-related, drug-induced uh, dryness. So there is multi-factors that can lead to dryness of the eye in the patient with rheumatoid. For the MAPS, uh, Dr. Amir, they were asking you about uh, which one is better than the other. Uh, what is the selective one? And the most important question is that, can we start with them for the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis or we should go through the guideline as you showed in your uh, slides? Um, now, the first uh, uh, question, the first part is that um, uh, all biologics have the same uh, level of efficacy and safety. This is why they are uh, put in the guideline in the same level of, um, of uh, fuels. And uh, just to tell you, in, in view of my experience, uh, maybe Dr. Khalif can also confirm that um, uh, all biologics have success and failure. So you cannot really say that one biologic is better than the other. It's just that you need to pick which biologic uh, uh, to use in your patient based on the patient characteristics, the patient preference, the comorbidities, and some predictors that we're not very good at uh, in uh, predicting the response. Um, uh, this is the first uh, uh, question. The second question, which is uh, um, again very important, is that uh, uh, can we start with biologics upfront? Now, as I have mentioned, methotrexate and other DMARs have a 30% chance of controlling the disease. And this is actually a very important point to take because you're using a very safe drug and very effective drug. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm a, uh, um, I start biologics upfront in patients, for example, who have been missed for years and coming to my clinic uh, with a suboptimal dose of methotrexate, and I don't have a lot of time to lose. Or a patient who has, for example, a contraindication to methotrexate, chronic liver disease, uh, uh, chronic kidney disease, interstitial lung disease, all of these patients, you cannot use methotrexate on these patients. This is why you might start a biologic upfront. Um, it's always a decision between patient physician. I, I don't think we should abuse that um, patients are covered in Saudi Arabia and they can use biologics upfront. We should always um, uh, go with the most cost effective uh, medication. Did you face a patient who was not responding to one biological and you had to transfer him to another one? Or it's not the case? This is our uh, daily living. I have, I have patients who have failed nine biologics. Oh, okay. okay. So it happens. Uh, the question also for uh, rituximab. They were telling you, uh, Dr. Amir, when do we combine it with the methotrexate? And do you oh. recommend that uh, in the first line of treatment? Always. Um, Methotrexate is actually a little bit tricky. Methotrexate in its clinical trial have shown a very marginal 
um, lower level of efficacy, level of efficacy compared to other barriers, but it does not make it, you know, the bad guy. Mitotrexate is very effective in seropositive patients. Um, um, the best data after failure of a first biologic are with rituximab. Uh, with rituximab. Um, uh, so rituximab is actually, you know, you know the uh, sidekick of heroes. Uh, it's it's a very good drug when you fail the first biologic, but it can be used as a first line biologic, especially in zero highly seropositive patients and patients who have a lot of um, active joints. Um, uh, saying that, uh, uh, methotrexate and other drugs that have uh, a chimeric part like infliximab. Um, have more immunogenicity, more development of autoantibodies and uh, leading to drug failure, which uh, uh, using methotrexate will improve their survival. Just having methotrexate on board with a biologic automatically improves the sur drug survival of this drug, improves its efficacy and its drug survival. Okay, so you don't have a contraindication, always methotrexate. <laughs> Okay, Dr. Adenia, have you faced a patient who had uh, rheumatoid arthritis and on the drugs that are contraindicated for cardiology, um, like cortisone sometimes or nonsteroids, where we don't use it much in cardiology patients? Uh, Dr. Adenia, unmute yourself, please. So uh, thank you, Fahad. So if I understood the question is if we contraindicate any medication for RA patient, cardiology, some cardiology patients. Yeah. Usually we tend not, we usually tend not to contraindicate anything unless this is uh, we, we tend to weigh the benefits and the risk of the of the of the medication on the disease like cancer patient, RA patient, anything. So if the the benefit taken from this medication is high, better than the, the risk, then we accept it. Now for the corticosteroid, this is really a dilemma for us because we always say please keep it the lowest dose, lowest dose possible, and the lowest and the time is the lowest time, smallest time. Why? Because they induce diabetes, they induce hypertension, and usually people don't respect their diet, so they become bigger and they eat salt and they have all this complication. So usually we don't we don't tend to uh, to stop or to contraindicate anything. Okay, good. Uh, did you ever um, refer your cardiac patients to rheumatoid um, specialty for treatment? For me, the question. You yeah, mean for, for you. The, well, for I, treatment. I usually uh, I uh, I don't diagnose RA patient, so uh, for a cardiology patient that is suffering from RA, usually they are diagnosed by themselves, and then we uh, we take over for uh, the rest of like if they have a MI or they have any other uh, or heart failure or something. Okay. So we together for them. But uh, but the question is for all the uh, our respectful uh, speakers. Is rheumatoid arthritis the cause of cardiology problems, or is cardiology the cause of rheumatoid arthritis? Uh, according to me, the more you have inflammation, uh, the more you will have a, a probability of having cardiac disease. So the trigger is actually the inflammation that's going on in the RA. The proof that is young patient, they are RA 35, 40. We don't have much young patient in cardiology. Most of them, they are older than 60 years. And actually, when they are young, you can see all the charts I showed you, they start at 40 or 50 or even at 60. So we don't have any scoring before because we consider that young patients are low risk of cardiology. So I think the trigger of all this is the going inflammation because of the RA. So yes, the RA is the cause of cardiovascular disease, not the opposite. Do we agree on that, Dr. Amir and Dr. Khalaf? If you allow me in like two minutes, let me tell you uh, what has been happening in the last maybe 50 years, uh, way uh, before I was born, of course. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, in the past, uh, patients with rheumatic diseases used to have um, a very low survival, and they used to die from their primary disease, uh, pulmonary hemorrhage, interstitial lung disease, uh, uh, infections, uh, and other complications of the medication they have been using, like gold and all of these medications. Once um, uh, effective therapies and the three-to-target strategy um, uh, was uh, adopted by rheumatologists, patients with rheumatic diseases uh, tend to live longer. Once these patients live longer, we have seen the phenomena of premature uh, uh, atherosclerosis or accelerated atherosclerosis 
and uh, cardiovascular disease. And uh, there, uh, there is a, a, a very important landmark study showing that the, the, the um, uh, survival or median uh, survival of patients with rheumatoid arthritis has, was reduced by eight years compared to, to, to normal people. And you can also uh, apply this to lupus, systemic sclerosis, systemic vasculitis. These patients now, because we control their disease, the damage caused by the disease and the medication we're using is showing us that inflammation and other related uh, uh, problems like obesity, like diabetes, hypertension, because these patients are not very active. Uh, uh, they don't exercise because normal people do not exercise. Just imagine you're fatigued, you're tired, you have right knee osteoarthritis and you're, you're, you're depressed. And uh, we can, we, I will advise you to exercise. Um, so, so inflammation is 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 really the the, the poison of, of of these patients. And once we control inflammation, they go gradually back to uh, the the level of controls or to non-RA patients. Similarly, we see that um, uh, in view of cancer. In the past, rheumatoid arthritis was shared with a way higher level of lymphoma compared to the normal population. Once uh, uh, we, we were better in controlling the disease, we don't see lymphoma anymore. Yeah. So the other question also for the pain management, uh, this is coming, uh, I think this is a very nice uh, question. They're asking us, do we have a local data about the evidence of uh, these selective and non-selective non-steroidals? Uh, the other thing that he's asking also um, for the pain relief, what is your recommendations for our uh, RA patients? Dr. Amer or Dr. Khalaf? Do, do we have a local this, evidence? Yeah. Lo local evidence? Uh, I don't think you know, we do have any local evidence, but anyway, uh, we have to understand why why the patient is in pain first. So, is this because of the disease activity? Is this uh, part of other uh, uh, coexistence disease that can happen with the patients with rheumatoid, especially fibromyalgia? So, we have to understand the, uh, what is the reason of the pain so that we can manage. So, always we are uh, in favor to put the patient in remission in form of no pain, no swelling joints. Uh, so this is our target. But patients who d develop damage to the joints with time, uh, they can have such p pain where you don't need to add more strong immunosuppressive therapy. What you need to do give them is a painkiller and physiotherapy for them and as well as occupational therapy. For patients with uh, uh, depression or fatigue, uh, sorry, depression or uh, fibromyalgia, so those patients, we manage them uh, in parallel with the uh, rheumatoid uh, arthritis management. So we give them an assessment by a psychiatrist first, and then we start either tricyclic antidepressant or uh, a brigabalin as an example. So it depends on the reason exactly why the patient is developing pain. In fact, there are patients who has been in remission with no sign of fibromyalgia, but they do have uh, a, a, a low threshold for pain. So they feel the pain easily because they've been having this uh, exhausted pain uh, uh, pathway in their system for years. So this is why we, once we get pain in patients with rheumatoid, we need to understand why do they have this pain to manage. If, if we have a patient who is uh, rheumatoid arthritis, on the top of that, uh, osteoporosis. Do we still give the same pathway of pain management or is it another pathway? So maybe we have to understand that osteoporosis, they don't have usually pain. Osteomalacia, the people who develop pain. Osteoporosis, uh, they get pain once there is a fracture happen. So, and those patients, we really need to be careful, especially for our rheumatoid arthritis. We don't like them to add more disability for them in form of developing fracture because we missed their uh, prophylactic measures that we give usually with vitamin D and calcium. So osteoporosis usually don't cause pain. Uh, so uh, once we get pain with uh, like with osteopenia, we think have we should think about osteomalacia rather than osteoporosis. Okay, and also Dr. Uh, Amir for the Jack, uh, they are telling us. Ah, go ahead. 
uh, one more point on the osteoporosis. Um, as uh, maybe when uh, we were talking about the medications, you could see that many of um, the um, uh, pathways involved in RA-related uh, inflammation induce osteoclasts. So you have uh, B and T lymphocytes um, uh, uh, promote osteoclast activation mm -hmm. potentiation, IL-6, TNF-alpha. So once you block inflammation, you control RA, you reduce um, uh, uh, not only the erosion and destruction in the joint, but also the secondary osteoporosis um, uh, that, that you see with RA. And uh, if uh, colleagues who are watching us are familiar with the FRAX score, Mm -hmm. yeah. The only comorbidity that you could see in the FRAX score is rheumatoid arthritis, alcohol, female gender, uh, 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 and other uh, uh, um, the results of the DEXA scan. But RA is an independent factor for development of osteoporosis. You control inflammation, you stop osteoclast to uh, eat up bone. They have a question also regarding the treatment of uh, rheumatoid arthritis in pregnancy. Uh, which uh, drug of choice would you recommend and uh, which is the most safest in pregnancy? Well, treating uh, a pregnant women is fun. You know, I <laughs> always people, if, uh, I could make all of my uh, uh, female patients and even my patients pregnant. That would make their disease better. Um, the issue is that uh, rheumatoid arthritis um, is a predominant TH1 pathway disease. So once uh, um, a female patient gets pregnant, uh, it switched to TH2 pathway. So uh, we have a 50 to 75% chance of going into a spontaneous remission. And actually we reduce their therapies. Now saying that you have a 25% uh, um, that unfortunately um, flared during the RA. And um, in view of uh, DMARTs, you have corticosteroids, small dose of corticosteroids, five to 10 milligram. You have hydroxychloroquine, sulfasalazine. These are the DMARTs that are safe in pregnancy. When you go to biologics, you have only the TNF family that are safe in pregnancy. Uh, the level of safety is a little bit different. So for example, sertolizumab has a 1% uh, um, uh, uh, transmission in the, in the placenta, while infliximab has maybe a 300 or 400 percent transmission through the placenta. But they are all considered safe. So um, okay. Good. all anti-TNFs are safe in pregnancy, but some of them have less transmission to the babies, and you just need to take some precaution in uh, the, uh, the vaccination of the newborn. The, the question, maybe that would be maybe the last one. Uh, if you have any recommendation for, for the rheumatoid arthritis patients with COVID-19, do you recommend anything specific for them? Um, we cannot forget COVID even in our uh, webinar. Okay, basically, the recommendations of the American College of Rheumatology and European League Against Rheumatology, uh, Rheumatism that have been um, uh, issued in the last uh, few months since the COVID-19 uh, pandemic um, uh, started is that patients with rheumatic diseases should not uh, stop or reduce their therapies uh, if they are asymptomatic. This is the first recommendation. The second recommendation, if they develop uh, um, uh, symptoms suggestive of uh, COVID-19, they need to seek uh, medical advice and to skip the dose of their biologics that they are seeing. Uh, uh, some drugs like tocilizumab, which uh, blocks uh, IL-6, which is an important uh, um, uh, cytokine in the um, uh, 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 inflammatory response related to COVID-19, uh, the European uh, 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 colleagues have uh, recommended to keep it if a patient has a severe COVID-19 infection. Um, uh, fortunately, I don't have uh, any experience in that. I have only one patient who developed COVID-19 and he's from outside the Riyadh. And I recommended uh, that he needs to, to go to his local rheumatologist to see him. Uh, uh, we're very um, uh, blessed that we don't have a lot of uh, patients in Saudi Arabia in general, and mm -hmm. not in the in the uh, 
Rheumatology Society. Maybe Abdelaziz can comment if he has seen any patients. Have you seen so, any patients? So, so far, so good, alhamdulillah. But so what, one of the things that even they were talking about, the, 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 the dosage of a steroid, the minimum that we can go with the corticosteroid usage, the better maybe for the patients. Uh, otherwise, as Dr. Amir, uh, we don't change any uh, line of therapy as the patient in remission. Okay, great. Thank you very much. It was really nice having you all, our uh, respectful uh, speakers. Thank you for the attendees. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, they are highly committed. All of them until now are still uh, with us. We exceeded the 3,000, uh, mashallah, participants. Uh, we had a lot of other questions that I was not able to ask, to ask today, but sure we'll send it uh, to your emails. Uh, any questions that we did not uh, have the time to answer now. Thank you very much the Saudi Heart Association for hosting uh, this uh, event. Thank you for the Saudi Pharmacy Group and of course for the Metoid uh, Association. It was really a pleasure having you and inshallah we'll be together in the coming webinar. Uh, we will send it uh, again uh, the same way uh, by the sites. And uh, I hope, inshallah, we can meet uh, very soon in our coming webinars. Thank you so much. And inshallah, see you soon in our new webinars. Thank you.